I can already welcome you all to this first CELS lunchtime lecture of uh, 2021. Uh, welcome everyone. And uh, my uh, special welcome today goes half, uh, half around the world to Professor Damien Chalmers, uh, who's the Vice Dean of Research uh, and the International Professor at uh, NUS. He is a known authority in um, European Union law, uh, also because he worked at uh, the LSE for 24 years as um, academic and later professor. He um, has a distinguished publishing career and today he's going to uh, talk to us about his take on data protection and data self-determination. A very warm welcome, uh, Professor Chalmers. And I should remind participants that please use the Q&A uh, tab if you have any questions and we will pick up your questions after uh, Professor Chalmers presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's a, it's a real privilege to be uh, uh, invited. Uh, I tend to waffle on, um, and I've got quite a few slides. So I'm just working out the uh, share screen technology, which I hopefully will do. Uh, we'll just give you a brief summary of what I'm going to talk about today. So if I run out of time, um, then please uh, um, I'll give you a, a brief idea of what it is. Now I'm not a, data protection is a sort of, if you like, a new area for me. And GDPR is, if anyone does a, a Google search, will find it's an extensively researched area. But I've got interested particularly in the comparative political economy of it, particularly how it's informing and beginning to shape um, data protection, uh, protection regimes around the world, particularly outside, outside, the, uh, outside Europe and the US. And to do that, I, I thought I wanted to just understand a little bit what was going on to my mind in the EU. And this is a, a paper presentation that aims to do that. So the argument goes some, something like this that if you look at the right to privacy as it's historically developed, you know, a lot of people, there's a famous book by Daniel Salah that says, it's a fair, he will argue it's a conceptually fairly incoherent right to, to find a core of the right to, uh, the right to privacy or the right to respect for privacy is quite challenging. But I tend to take the view that the way privacy has evolved has been a little bit different. There is a logic to it, even if one's looking and you know, the, the doctrine is sometimes a little bit contradictory. And the logic's historically been this. Certainly, I think you could say up until the early 90s, it was the following, that the, pro the processes of modern life uh, can put unreasonable demands on individuals. And privacy is there really to police these uh, unreasonable demands. And as pr processes change over time, uh, so the doctrinal content of this right changes. Uh, they, these processes and their demands have shaped the doctrine a little bit. Now, what has happened with data protection was, I think one could see that in the early years. But when um, one got towards developing, in particular, the single market uh, in data protection, particular the 95 develop, um, directive, and these, these developments have been accelerated uh, significantly by the GDPR, privacy acquired a new dimension in addition to this. It became associated also as almost a good, a, a right and entitlement to the management of one's personal development. What privacy increasingly was about was cult cultivating not sort of the, the individual's personal development, of, often for them and how this was managed. 
And because it acquired the, became, if you like, a good in its own right, a process in its own right, this meant that the unreasonable demands that uh, um, data protection has put on have been poorly policed. And this, this is basically the argument. Now, I will start, and I'll just uh, to do it in a second, by uh, sort of clearing the brush a bit and giving you, for those of you who are EU lawyers or other data protection experts, uh, beginners sweep through the GDPR and pointing out some paradoxes about it. But, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's hailed as marvellous, but on the other, there are many things that are quite problematic about it. And what I'll argue in this paper is that a lot of the challenges with this arose from the transplant of a principle of German constitutional law, uh, the principle of informational uh, self-determination, which works well, works pretty well within the German constitutional context, to EU economic law, they became a market-making principle. And this principle above everything else and the way it was transplanted by EU law generated a lot of the, the shape of the market that we currently now have in the EU but increasingly also beyond. So that's the argument. And if I run out of time, hopefully that'll just uh, keep you on board. So the GDPR, uh, uh, Regulation 2006-679, uh, a beginner's guide for it. First of all, it sets, although there's only four mentioned, there's sort of six uh, conditions by which your personal data, my personal data, uh, may be processed by members, may be managed, held, disclosed, used, stored by someone else. The first is where there's express consent. That consent has to be free, specific, uninformed, unambiguous. I also put examples, I also put there certain proxies for consent, where the data in particular, where the data is necessary for the performance of another contract to which the subject is party, or where I've asked someone to enter into such a contract, a preparatory step and the data is necessary for that. The second circumstance is, uh, or the third circumstance where it can uh, be used is where the, uh, uh, um, the, person, the process, the person in charge of using it has a legitimate interest uh, in using it, but this has to be balanced against this, my civil liberties in particular, my privacy. Uh, the fourth is where, they, well, well, this, this is where I don't have my consent, but it's necessary to process it in my vital interests. And the final one is where it's associated on the, the fifth and the sixth, where it's in the public interest or there's some related exercise of authority. So those are circumstances when, if you like, someone else can use, have, uh, disclose your, your, your personal data. Now, alongside that, there are uh, quite uh, extensive responsibilities that uh, are put in charge of the data controller, the person in charge of all of this. They can only do this if it's in accordance with the law, if it's legitimate and fair, that they have to use is accurate, they have to ensure that it's uh, secure, and they have to ensure that the data that they process is proportionate, it can't be held for longer, to the purposes for which it's being used and relevant to those purposes and adequate. Uh, next, they have to communicate to, to the data subject in particular, uh, provide them clear uh, information about what they're doing with the data. Thirdly, this is one of the significant innovations of the GDPR. There's a principle of data protection by design that they should take technical or organizational measures to minimize the personal data that's processed. Process. They should use uh, state-of-the-art technology where possible to ensure as little personal data is processed as possible. Another thing that they have to do, where there are high risks in the data or they're using new technologies, uh, is uh, particular forms of AI, is carry out an impact assessment on the protection of personal data. And where their core activity is significant processing, they have to have data protection officers, if you like compliance officers. And then finally, uh, finally, and I'm just putting, uh, you have the rights of the data subject. I haven't, I'm not dealing with the, uh, the regulatory bodies. Uh, I have you know, data subject have the right to ascertain and be notified of the purposes for which someone's data they're using the processing one's data, who they might disclose it to, and if the, this was added by the GDPR, the period for which it's going to be held. You next have the right to correct in, uh, inaccurate data, the data they put is just not true, 
Now, the right to erase data, this is the right to be forgotten, where the grounds for processing have disappeared. There's the right to data portability. This is a new right added by the GDPR, where if you're, you should be able to take your data and have it processed by someone else, and it has to be done in a form where you can sort of carry it to someone else. And finally, you have the right to object to someone using your data for profiling purposes, particularly where this has been done in the public interest heading or the legitimate interest of the processor. So that is a beginner's guide and a very crude guide to what the GDPR is about and does. Now, there are some paradoxes when you look at the GDPR. For my mind, to my mind, these were really significant paradoxes. The first is it's amazingly influential. This is why the European Commission just can't talk about the GDPR enough at the moment to, or data society. Uh, even though big tech doesn't have to incorporate uh, its requirements for stuff outside the EU, you'll find it in incorporated into all the requirements of big, big tech uh, companies. There's been a rush of laws around the world to parallel the GDPR's terms. Now, one has to be a bit careful because a lot of states will say that they aren't doing it for those purposes. And the laws often have significant divergences with the GDPR. But in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore have all changed their laws. Now, Japan, uh, South Korea have, Brazil has, Kenya has. And uh, the California Consumer Protection Act, although there's a lot of debate about it, 2020, some parallels are seen between it and the GDPR. Uh, so the GDPR has had some transplant, transplanting effects. In some cases, it's because states have free trade agreements and they want to have free movement of data with the EU. I think that's certainly the case for Singapore, Japan, and South Korea. The third thing, the EU has modestly marked its own homework and called it a Magna Carta, the GDPR, but they're particularly proud that uh, other international bodies like the uh, the GDPR, particularly because of its notion of consent, uh, that's at its heart. And they point, the Commission's pointed to a speech by the UN Secretary General in December 2019, the Italian Senate. He said the EU should lead the digital age. You'll have seen that von der Leyen's been talking to Biden about a new common rule book. And I don't think she's thinking that the EU follow US data protection law, but more <laughs> the US align itself where possible with the GDPR. Now that's all very well, but it, you then, if you look at what's happening on the ground, you find a lot of con contradictions about the GDPR. Very low levels of compliance uh, with the GDPR. There were studies done one year after it came in, which suggested as many as 72% of companies were missing their obligations. There was an interesting report by the UK Information Commission officer, which looked at the data broking industry. These are the big harvesters of data in the world. In the UK, they have data on absolutely everyone in the UK. All of them were breaking the GDPR in quite flagrant ways. There are arguments that data brokerage, which is one of the most problematic industries for protection of personal data, is less well policed in the EU than the US. People have also pointed out that the GDPR at its most extensive, so this is how I expect the Court of Justice to interpret it, is it allows any data which, for which I can become identifiable is caught by the GDPR is very uh, over-inclusive. It can include so much if you think about the data that can be covered by that, not just data that relate, relates directly to me, but anything by which a machine can identify me. So, so some critics have called about, talked about it becoming the law of everything. Thirdly, whilst it's very fashionable to slag off China, particularly China's uh, use of information technology. It's an interesting thought experience to consider, it, would the GDPR prohibit what China does? So if you looked at China's extensive surveillance in Xinjiang, which really is like something out of a Tom Cruise film, that would almost certainly be allowed under the GDPR under state security um, grounds. Uh, the ANT social credit scheme which is actually now being attacked in China by the authorities, which is this uh, idea that everyone has a social score based on almost everything. Isn't a world array from the five C's credit rating systems that actually used 
in places like the UK. And finally, one always has to be a bit skeptical about a system of being the Magna Carta for data protection when Amazon and Axiom, which is the world's, I think, biggest data broker, so this is absolutely fantastic and the US should have it. So it's worth thinking a little bit what's going on here, whether GDPR, uh, you know, clearly has some promise, but there are contradictions there. So let me just take you now through a little bit through my argument and just bear with me a second because I haven't actually just have to find what I'm doing for time. So the argument about privacy. Now, historically, privacy has been known as a famous article by Brandeis and Warren from 1890. This is probably one of the more uh, long-standing law articles over 100 years and it's still known, which is some sort of record, I think, from a Harvard Law Review. It was a Harvard Law Review. And that piece on privacy, they said, privacy is the right to be let alone. This is historical view of privacy that the early cases in uh, the European Court of Human Rights talked about this as a right to protection from arbitrary interference from the state. And historically, we think of privacy as seclusion. Now, even if one starts with that definition, what is interesting about that is that notion is associated with the early 19th century. when there was the growth of the administrative state, of extensive policing, classification, detailed regulations. Identity at that stage was as understood as requiring us all to conform to particular types. So it was very much a reaction, that definition of privacy, against this move for conform, conformity and this growth of the overextensive uh, administrative state. What begins to happen in the 50s and 60s is that privacy get, acquires a new, def, a new meaning. And this is privacy oh, concerns began to emerge, not about the state poking into our bedrooms, just about what it did with all the information it already had about us. This became, this became increasingly, increasing concerns about this with the growth of the welfare state, the use of census, censuses, and a series of scandals uh, in Europe, in particular in the 1960s. And what you find in the US in the Fair Information Practices, Council of Europe resolutions that began to emerge, legislation that de uh, developed first of all in HESA, the first, you know, the gem, first place in Germany, in Europe to have it, the first German landman in Sweden in the early 70s, was governance on how public administrations, but also private organizations, but they were seen as less of a problem at that stage, or less acute problem, managed the information they had about us. So data was only bigger to be collected if it was proportionate uh, to the purposes, that carried for sort of collected for lawful purposes, it had to be accurate and up to date, and subjects had to know what was held about them and be able to check if it was accurate. And there were, concern, there were also particular worries about sensitive data, data that might be used to, uh, I should put pressurize a subject. And this was very much the view of privacy that was taken in the 60s and 70s. But then something quite interesting happens in the mid 70s. The US, which was concerned increasingly as it began to, I think, get credit card industries, I think, and want to use citizen, uh, individuals' data for transnational transactions, began to get worried that the growth of the laws that were developing in Western Europe in particular at that time might impede free flow of information, which began to be developed quite aggressively and transnational trade, the free flow, the free flow of information uh, case law from the 60s by the US Supreme Court. Uh, in the meantime, the Council of Europe had come to the idea that having a general privacy convention might be a good thing because it saw pa parallels in how all European states were handling this issue of governance of how we are known. And this coalesced in the mid 70s around two things. The OECD became a forum for developing common principles on privacy to allow transnational flows of information. Alongside that was agreed that the Council of Europe should pay heed to this and develop a convention, convention which became Convention 108, on the processing of personal data. Now, both the OECD gu guidelines and the uh, Council of Europe Convention um, uh, re-articulate, they elaborate a little bit more, but basically they re-articulate uh, 
the stuff that had been developed in national practice and earlier Council of Europe resolutions on governance of how we're known. But they did two further things. They dealt with this issue of transnational flows of, uh, of information. Now, the way the OECD guidelines dealt with it was to say that in principle, these privacy restrictions were only um, permissible if they were proportionate, if they did not exceed what was necessary to protect privacy. Um, uh, so states, states could uh, hold on to it, but not go, go much further. Now, could, you know, states could impose restrictions, but they had to be related and proportionate uh, to these governance requirements. The Council of Europe a convention went much further. The Council of Europe Convention, Convention 108 does something very, very interesting. On the one hand, it says, it's iconography, iconography is that it's about protecting privacy. It's nothing else, it's about pr protecting the right uh, to respect for privacy in the context of processing data. But then it relativizes this right, both in the preamble and Article 12. In the preamble, it says that this right has to be reconciled with and it says the fundamental right, which I'm not sure existed at that time in Europe, to free flow of information. So it's very much a US concept. And then in Article 12, it doesn't reconcile them. It just says basically that there should be no restrictions on flow of data on grounds of privacy. It makes two exceptions for this. One is for sensitive data, um, where there's not equivalence between the two states. And the other is where the data might be retransferred to a state that is not in the Council of Europe, not part of the convention. Now here what one has is something quite unusual. The privacy has now been used for something quite unique as a justification for transnational flows of information. The convention and to some extent the OECD guidelines only make sense if you understand that it now becomes something that privacy is the justification of transactions in personal data. However, the problem with the convention was that it didn't really create a market. It didn't really specify for what purposes um, personal data could be processed. It was very, very gener generic. So there was still a lot of disagreement and difference in laws about when there could be transactions in personal data. And this was picked up at the beginning of the 80s in quite a significant way by the Commission and the European Parliament who said Europe had to do something about this. There had to be greater harmonization as part of the single European Act on the basis of Convention 108. But this didn't really get anywhere for many years uh, because uh, crudely the member states didn't see much interest in the market in personal data at that stage. So it's well, well, be well before really the growth of the internet. Things changed as there began to be concerns about use of data within the context of Schengen. And in 1995, you get Directive 9546EC, which is the first significant EU law instrument on um, protection, the Directive on Protection of Personal uh, Data Protection Directive. Now, my view is that this directive set in place as the template for the GDPR. In many ways, one finds in the GDPR is just an acceleration with one or two significant things um, of this directive. What this directive does that's really significant is it creates a market, an autonomous market in personal data. First of all, at every, every aspect, first of all, the EU law gatekeeps who and what can enter the market. Data can by and large only be processed within the EU on, for the grounds that are set out in EU law. It's exhaustive harmonization. So states can't introduce new grounds and they can't, if, uh, if data meets the six, uh, the six purposes stipulated by EU law, you have to allow it to be processed. Secondly, the, uh, this is the old definition of personal data. It specifies the subject matter of the market by setting out a definition of data. Thirdly, by setting out a definition of uh, processing, it specifies the types of transactions that can be uh, can, uh, can take place. It then specifies the market actors, data subjects who can transact in their own data, and data controllers who can be in charge of processing the data of others. And then it does, it provides a limited liberalization, transnationalization of this right. It says in principle, uh, data that meets this directive, states can't restrict 
its flows, transnational flows, on grounds of fundamental rights. Now, that is in a crude way what the directive says, but that in itself I do not think is particularly interesting. So the next 10 minutes I'll just say a little bit about the principle of information self-determination and how I see it as interesting. Now the directive, before I come on to principle, does something very interesting in Article 1. It says its purposes are to do two things. Article 1.1, 1, 1, it's uh, to ensure that member states respect privacy uh, in the uh, processing of data. And the second thing is it really provides for liberalization of trade and personal data. It's based on what's now Article 114 and Article 12 has this market access provision. Now the background to the directive was that Ger German law was highly influential. And it's worth me just saying what I'm talking about here. In particular, whilst the directive refers repeatedly to the right to respect for privacy, it's worth thinking who's the right to respect for privacy. And the conception that, as I see, was set out in German law, interpretation of that, informational self-determination, was pretty influential. Now, the right to informational self-determination uh, is stems from a 1983 judgment of the German Constitutional Court, which all Germans, Marcus, I'm sure, is very familiar with, which where they had to review and they found repugnant various, act, various elements of a census act that was done in 1983. And in that, the court set out this new right, which they said involved two things. It involved, first of all, a right to self-determination, which is a right to choose whether to disclose data about oneself, uh, and whether to follow up on that choice. I will come back to that. There's this element of uh, choice and deliberation. And alongside that, they said uh, the right to informational self-determination includes rights of personality. And they, in, the, in this judgment, they said this had two aspects. There was sort of an inviolable, I shouldn't say private law, an inviolable sort of private area of the individual they right to. And for these, these purposes, they also had said it involved the the right to publicly represent oneself, the right to determine to a certain extent how one was represented to others. Now they said that it followed from these two things, that in, individuals had a right to correct, to know and correct what was known about them. And so this is particularly so because of three reasons, and this is my, my language, not the courts, three risks. Omniscience, there was a concern that if someone knew everything about you, it might chill the actions that you take. You might be frozen from doing things either in social life or political life. There's a danger that they might represent what you're about. Uh, they might put out false data. And finally, they might use this uh, information to manipulate, manipulate you. Now, the right to informational self-determination only has a relative weight in German law it can, because it can be used by individuals to stop freedom of expression, to stop. Um, it can be outweighed in two other circumstances. Where, uh, and then the court said, one is the public interest and one is the legitimate interests of others. And it, when it was thinking about legitimate interests of others, it was thinking particularly about journalists. Now, in that judgment, it is a judgment very much of German public law and German constitutional law. The strong idea has been a vibrant public sphere and a balance between that and this idea of individual private choice and this right to personality. Uh, linked to human dignity. Now, what, I think the link between it and the directive and between it and current EU law is quite strong for a number of reasons. First of all, the people who've been strongly involved with the principle of information self-determination in German constitutional law, particularly Costa Sanitas, who set up the first Hessel Act, were also involved in drafting the directive and had a pretty exclusive role. The commission only allowed them to be really involved with the initial proposal. Uh, so its architects were pretty much the same. Secondly, if you just look at the, what can one say, the uh, constitutional context, this was uh, the period of Wunscher, uh, the uh, and you know, the Solange doctrine. You know, the EU, EU lawyers knew they, that they would get a free pass in this civil liberty sensitive area if they could show that their protection was at least as good 
as that, uh, or there was a commitment to being at least as good as that in uh, national constitutional law. And this was the main national constitutional court judgment at the time. So if you satisfied this, you'd be fine. And thirdly, if you look at the directive, at a formal level, it parallels in a very powerful way the informational self-determination uh, doctrine. So the market constitution reasons, the reasons for allowing data to be transacted, follow the information self-determination. Consent, public interest, legitimate interests. Secondly, one can find the same market regulating controls that are all about the, uh, the right to know and correct what is known about you. Um, the right to be forgotten, it's a much later right that was developed in 2014 by ECJ case law. And thirdly, there is this concern, albeit perhaps not as, uh, as authentic in my view as that of the German Constitutional Court with the private sphere, data process system, personal household activities is uh, excluded, the legitimate interests of the private have to be balanced against the right of privacy of the uh, data subject. And there are some restrictions where, where profiling takes place. And undoubtedly, those were the, I think, the good intentions of the architects. But this transplant is all about the danger of what happens when you transplant one principle from one area of law, this German constitutional law, to another, to EU economic law. And I'll just go through this, and then I'll probably whiz through the things. So the first thing that happened with the directive was that it changed the main, the central basis for which data was processed. And if you look in the German Constitution of the 1983 uh, Census Act judgment, they, the, the, the reason public authorities say they can process data is normally the public interest. That is not the case with market actors. They will always be arguing or trying to get the consent one way or another of the data, data subject. Now this has an interesting effect. It means that realization of privacy or informational self-determination, a choice to disclose, and realization of the market often become the same event. The agreement to allow someone to use your data becomes a transaction or enables the transaction. The second feature that's unusual about consent with both GDPR and the, uh, its predecessor is that we're under German constitutional law, consent was central to allowing individuals to reflect, deliberate, they could change their mind. Consent is used in a different way in, the, in EU data protection law. It's obtained promise that if the uh, other party asks you for your data and you sort of agree, then you're almost bound to let them use it at least for a while. So it's stripped of its elements of reflection, uh, information, reconsideration. There's none of the cooling off periods you'd have with EU cons um, consumer protection. Now, as a consequence of consent becoming the main vehicle for processing, something else quite interesting happens. That if you look at the informational self-determination principle, it now becomes about not governing, this is sort of the, it gets removed from its initial context, which is the discussion of relations between individual and state, to governing private relations. Uh, and this was only something that was agreed by in the German Constitutional Court, by the way, which should be said in 2019. And not just that, it taxes those relations. And what I mean by that is the person that's processing you, the individual, uh, your personal data has a lot of duties. It costs them money, uh, crudely. And so there has to be a good reason or a return for them doing it. And next, it says something quite interesting about privacy. Both informational self-determination and the DBTD that say there is no collective interest in my seclusion. I have a right to, or to let someone else know everything about me, absolutely everything, no matter how intimate, how shaming, how gross. Now, the original principle said, well, that's done so on the axis of choice. It is slightly different with the DBT, uh, uh, with EU data protection law because it's no longer about choice. You do this to help establish a market. There are incentives on the market. The market is given over to ensuring the efficiency of the management of this information, but in terms of it being allocated efficiently or 
used efficient, uh, produced, used efficiently. So there is a collective interest in sharing that information. It may be subject to my consent, but it's the collective interest is now weighed in further of, in, in favor, a bit of soft way, in favor of sharing that information. Now, if that's so, what does it mean to say, well, this is about protecting privacy. It's not about protecting seclusion anymore. Now, ECJ has been absolutely clear that the Data Protection Directive realizes the right to privacy and the right to data protection, invented a new fundamental right for us, or EU law did us. And Pushka says that if you meet the requirements of Data Protection Directive, you meet the requirements of these rights. They're, what, they're one and the same thing. That's the 2017 ECJ judgment from Slovakia. Now, my own view when I looked at it was looking at what, how it's developed in the US, and there's some ECH case on this. It says that privacy is moving towards, I want to say, an individual right to personal development, but to a notion of personal development. But what happens when people share their privacy is they get, they get the access to important spaces, virtual spaces, the ECH case law, particularly about the right of people with disabilities to use public spaces, but you could use Article H for that. And increasingly, privacy has been seen in that right. That, in my view, that was taking place, and I don't say this as any defender of this, is that privacy is you being used as a management of your personal development. This is what is happening with the, the Facebook, whoever else, as guardians of this semi-private space. And data protection experts, people like Dana Board, have pointed out that you know, teenagers, when they use Facebook, it's precisely as a semi-private space to converse with other teenagers for good and for bad, away from their parents. So they've moved the information society and privacy to this idea of personal development. Now, alongside this, a number of other things happen because it may be they're now guardians of your personal development, but it's a market. And the market relies on information rather than personal knowledge. So they strip down your personal knowledge to bite-sized bits, but they also strip down your knowledge, they take away tacit knowledge. It's knowledge only that can be ex explicit. And by doing this, what that means is, because we know more than we can say, they strip down things that are very important to most people's self-knowledge, particularly according to psychologists, ideas of meaning, experience, and awareness, all rely on things that we don't articulate. These have to be repackaged when they are shaped back to us in knowledge. And I'll just deal with one final thing, which is that data controllers, that if you looked at the original directive, well, there's provision for independent uh, agencies. The data controllers, the people managing the data, if one looks, they are the center of regulatory clarity. There's, there's no doubt about that. There's the assumption they will engage in self-regulation. But it was weakly uh, regulated or weakly specified. Now, because I'm running out of time, I'll just go back to the GDPR and just say how the GDPR changed things. That the GDPR, as I'll say, put some much more explicit conditions, particularly on consent. Uh, it does a little bit of stuff on the rights of the data subject. But what it adds that's particularly interesting, in my view, is where it's real oomph was is on the responsibilities of the data controller. It formalizes these notions of self-regulation, much stronger requirements for data protection officers, impact assessment, and data protection by design. And how does this change things? Right, I'll just go through this and hopefully allow you five minutes for questions. The first thing that happens is the GDPR, in relation, in relation to the Data Protection Directive, I say it fetishizes consent. And what do I mean by that? It requires consent to be much more express than it previously was. Individuals have to actively consent much more vigorous, uh, much more obviously to their data being used. There's a possibility, the consent is more ongoing now. There's a possibility to withdraw consent at any time. And it's more wide ranging. You can swap people uh, who are managing your data. Um, you can, uh, you get more information about what your data is being used for, so you can be see if you're happy on it. The only problem with this is it's been known since the 60s, the so-called privacy 
paradox, that people don't manage, aren't very active managers of their privacy. This idea that people actively consent and think about it each time, even if they could, and there's strong evidence that they don't have the information to do that. The latest survey I saw was about 2.8% are typically interested in it in experiments. So it overstates this. And surprisingly enough, the commission has noticed that no data portability of much note has taken place in the two years of the, uh, since the regulation came in. So if consent is a problem at the beginning when you just have to tick a box, right, you have to read the notices, you obviously not get, it's gonna be even more of a problem for monitoring. So it's worth thinking um, what consent is being used for. And that should not say ex ante, that should say ex post, that's a typo. That increasingly, if you look at what the new consent is being used to, uh, it's increasingly used after you've initially allowed the person to process the data. And what one's agreeing to at that moment is checking what sort of persona is being developed. There's the idea that at a certain point, if they develop things or don't develop things in a way you don't like, you can withdraw it or correct it or remove it or whatever. Now that's all very well, but my view is that what's happening here is that if you see them as developing personal development, is it that people are gonna object because they've got, they see violations of their privacy or the information not being used in the right way? Or is it more likely that the returns, that what's being offered for the exploitation of the data isn't great enough? That what might happen is the services aren't particularly good enough or whatever, the gimmicks, et cetera. So my own view of what's happening here isn't so much that it's about privacy, but ensuring a market between processes of data where they increasingly offer returns in return, uh, uh, more gimmicks, more toys, more, more jangles in return for processing your data. It's not so. Secondly, what's taking place in terms of the competitive geographies? How's this affecting people who are actually managing your data? Well, it's strongly that there's, two, there's, two, there's three types of group. There's people who manage data and the information they do, they really want the data just to know something about you, to sell you something. I mean, that's still, still be quite extensive. And these are the groups that have really struggled with the GDPR because most of the burdens are of the GDPR are front up burdens. Um, and that's where you've seen all the debate about it being over costly. Now, alongside that, you've got this formalization of self-regulatory duties for those engaging in significant processing, the Facebook of this world, data protection officers, design, impact assessment, codes of assessment, etc. And what I'd say about that is that it will be quite interesting to see how these develop. Increasingly, there is resort to, or suggestions of resort to use greater use of international and European standards. And it's been suggested that these standardization processes might be places where different stakeholders come together to, if you like, work out different conflicts. But as with anything, these conflicts will be skewed. Um, people are managing your privacy. Yes, they might want to do it in a way that's reputationally good for them, but they will still want to get returns and they will still want to do it in a way that um, uh, um, provides services to others. Now, I'll, I'll leave this, I'll, I'll, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this slide and then I'll stop. Um, the next thing that's quite interesting happening is what the GDPR does for EU's relations beyond the world. What happened with the Data Protection Directive was there's a group, there was a push to consolidate the market, both internally and externally. So it didn't just affect transnational trade, it affects absolutely all processing, whatever its scale in the EU. And free flows couldn't take place beyond the EU if uh, the data protection wasn't adequate. So the commission traditionally interpreted that broadly at least as good as EU law. Now the GDPR takes this a bit further. It says the commission can now only grant adequacy decisions, so it can only allow free flow of people's data, not just if the, there's an independent agency that's following GDPR rules, 
But if the state generally uh, respects rule of law or fundamental rights, so you're not, your data is not going to China anytime soon. Now, alongside that, however, the GDPR provides for transfer what, do, for what it calls binding corporate rules. These have to be authorized by an EU data protection office. So these binding corporate rules were typically between groups of enterprises, or they can be certification by standards, uh, which have to be binding, and they have to meet EU standards. So it's a basic, a form of private regulation, which is signed off by a private agreement by an agency in the EU. And one already sees international standards being developed to try and meet this. And there's a lot of debate about whether these are GDPR compliant or not. Now, this, this is interesting because this transplant effect has generated political economies of data protection in all the states that have responded to the GDPR. And you find two, two, two responses. Some who emphasize ex ante consent, so Singapore where I am is one, and others who focus on ex post accountability, the responsibilities of data processors. And how these play out, how the data protection authorities will work out what the regimes are all about will be interesting. It will not simply be about data protection, it will be over time about competitive advantage. Alongside this, I think it's likely that you, you might also have some sort of data, data, data nationalism, data protection nationalism. Um, and um, sorry, let me just uh, go back. Oops. Uh, and let me just, if I can just click. Uh, and what I mean by this is there's a good chance that in deciding whether firms are data compliant, both under these binding corporate rules within the EU, but outside the EU, you know, competitive advantage, questions of being more skeptical of data protection standards of foreign firms or one's own firms, may in turn become an issue. And I will stop there um, and uh, I'm happy to take questions and apologies for overrunning a bit. Um, thank you very much, uh, Damien. Thank you very much, Professor Chalmers. Um, um, we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions.